If you've got your Bibles, you can turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10, and we'll be reading from verse 19 to 39, Hebrews 10, 19 to 39. We're in a, a long series to the book of Hebrews, and we've come to that infamous text in Hebrews, uh, which talks about the deliberate sin after believing that leads to condemnation. And I, I want to say that uh, this has caused a great level of distress for many Christians, this verse that says, if you continue to uh, sin after you believe, there is no longer any sacrifice. Uh, I remember actually when I first got saved, um, I was reading through the Bible at rapid paces and I got to this verse and it, it just it stuck me like in, the, in my tracks. It just completely stopped me uh, to read just, if you continue to sin after you've believed, there's no hope. And it really has. It's caused a great, deal, a great deal of problems and and pain spiritually for many Christians in their life. And I want to encourage you this morning. Before we even start, we have to read this in light of the context of it, of the whole book, and in light of the gospel. And you will see there is great, great encouragement. There's encouragement, in fact, to just keep on believing. So, with that in mind, let's read Hebrews 10, verse 19 to 39. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great uh, priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with sincere hearts and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how we may spur one another onwards towards love and good deeds, not giving up the meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as unholy the things, uh, uh, sorry, who has treated as unholy things the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, and I will repay again. The Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Remember those early days when you had received the light, when you had endured the great conflict of a, a full of suffering, Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. Other times you stood side by side those who were, uh, who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted confiscation of your property because you knew that yourselves had a better and lasting possession. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while... He who is coming will come and will not delay, and by my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. May the Lord bless the reading of his word this morning. Now, the writer of the book of Hebrews is actually summing up a long argument in this chapter 10 that he started all the way in chapter 5. So it is a long kind of thought that has been running through. And I just want to say, if it seems a little bit repetitive since chapter 5, it's because of the beauty of the rhetoric of the writer of the book of Hebrews. In fact, the book of Hebrews is one of the most complex in all of the New Testaments. Not only is the Greek impeccable and complex, but the argument follows some of the greatest rhetoric in all of Greek literature. It's a truly beautiful book to study, and it's actually, most scholars come to it as problematic. 
Uh, because, and I'll just admit, I'm a systematician. I am not a biblical scholar. I come to this book and the Greek just confuses me. And that's why I have to lean on the expertise of people who spent their life poring over these texts and over texts of the ancient Greek world. But what it beautifully shows is that we actually need to read the Bible on its own terms. You see, so many Christians today, especially in the 21st century, especially in like the explosion from about the 1990s onwards, Christianity took this weird kind of, I don't even know how to describe it, like a weird sidetrack when it came to reading the Bible, where we just take verses and read them as prose. You know, like, I'll just pick a verse, and this is my verse for the day. This is my verse for the year, you know. Uh, this is what God is saying to me now. And I just want to say, unfortunately, us evangelicals are most guilty of this. And it becomes seriously dangerous. See, the Bible is a complex literary library consisting of poetry, wisdom, narrative, historical books, apocalyptic books, and letters. And if we fail to read it on its own terms, church, we fail to read it. We just fail to read it. There's a great story of a man who wanted to find out the will of God for his life. And so he opened up his Bible and happened to come to Matthew 27, verse 5, and he pushed his finger down, you know, closed his eyes, put his finger down, and read... He went away and hanged himself. And he's like, okay, well, no, wait, this is not what God is saying to me. So he opened up the Bible and flicked through again, closed his eyes and put his finger down. And happened on Luke 10, verse 37, which said, now go and do likewise. <laughs> really not liking that answer. He flicked through a third time, closing his eyes and still in the Gospels. He was now worried. He's like, let's stay with Jesus. And he put his finger down on John 13, verse 27, where it says, What you're about to do, do quickly. <laughs> now, obviously, God was not telling him to kill himself. Right? He was telling him to kill himself quickly. God was done. You know? He flicked through the Old Testament to get confirma confirmation. It says, you know, in, in Genesis, I will not contend with, this, with man for much longer. You know? Yeah, so... But this is how we read the Bible. In fact, most of our devotions, and not to pick it on, it's a great app. I love version, but most of the devotions in version are less than three verses. Which means you're completely reading texts out of context. And not getting what God is saying to you. The Bible is a library, not a book. It's a library. There are letters, and I don't know about you, but I've never received a letter and read it in five sentences at a time. Have you? You know, when me and my wife were dating, I'd receive a letter from her and open up in the first three lines and be like, okay, that's enough for me today. I've received love. <laughs> no, I would read through the whole thing because that was the message. Well, read a letter as a letter. Read an apocalypse as an apocalypse. Read a prophecy as a prophecy and a history as a history. Now... If you do not know how to read those things, what does that mean you have to do? We hate this in the 21st century because it sounds a little bit too much like work. You have to learn to read them like such. This is why we come to church. This is why we lean on scholars. It's not lambaste the scholars. The scholars are great. They can go wrong. But the scholars are how we learn. And you in the 21st century live in an abundant age of available and cheap information to learn how the Bible is written. And this verse, this chapter, serves as such a beautiful example of taking in the entirety of an argument, of a letter, and reading it in context. You simply can't take a verse and just build a theology on it. And you can't take your theology and try and shove it into a verse. You need to let the letter and the verse speak for itself. And so what is the argument of this chapter? What is the call and conclusion of this argument? Well, it's simple. It's the call to unwavering faith. That's what it is. The main focus of this entire book, of this entire letter is a call to this congregation to continue in the faith, in the gospel that they received. 
In the 10 chapters that preceded this verse, that has been the constant, constant reminder. Unfortunately, preaching through an entire book like this, it makes me sound like a stuck record. Because it's the same message every week. Because they're making the same point in every single part of his book. But this becomes more important as we get into this important uh, verse, which we'll cover in our next point. Ten chapters of this book have argued for the single and undeniable point. Continue in the faith that was presented to you in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't go back to the false Jewish religion or the false Jewish idea of salvation by works. We've covered this in the services of the last couple of months. It's it's undeniably clear. But I want to make it clear to you again. You are saved by faith, by grace alone. That is how you're saved. From start to finish, you cannot add anything to that, and you can't take anything away from that. What Christ has done for you on the cross is finished. And if that is true, you know what you can be? It's pretty secure, right? Church, we are saved by a glorious, almost unbelievable act of grace. And I I really, I'm going to make this clear. I'm going to say it again. You are saved by grace alone through faith alone. Again, you can take nothing away and you can add nothing to that. That is actually just the entire argument of this book. The gospel makes us completely and unquestionably secure in the fact that our salvation is secure. Why? Why? Because you didn't do it. It's that simple. Let me ask you. When you first believed, did you come with great acts? Was it written? Have we got a great sign outside the church that says, the ten Herculean acts to be a member of Wilrow Park Church. You know, kill the great hydra. uh, Slay the demons, you know. uh, Overcome your idols. Is that our entry point? Or do we call sinners and say, come to the cross and find the love of Jesus for sins? Do we preach, Christ came into the world, this is a true and trustworthy statement, Christ came into the world to die for saints, of which I am chief. No, we say, this is a true and trustworthy statement, that Jesus Christ came into the world to die for sinners, of which I am chief. Paul was making that as a, as a statement for the whole church. Paul was not trying to one-up the church. Like saying, guys, Jesus came for you sinners, but I am a greater sinner than all of you. Like I'm the most deservant of who Jesus came. No, it's a statement to the entire church. You are the chief of sinners. I am the chief of sinners. We're in this together. I love what Michael Heiser, the Old Testament scholar, would often say. What you couldn't gain by moral perfection, you can't lose by moral imperfection. That is a profound, profound realization. And I need to make this absolutely clear because we are constantly in danger of making lines in the church that says, you know what, these people are saved because, and these people are saved because of not. Right? They can't be saved because dot, dot, dot. We don't know the struggles of people. We don't know what they're going through. Tim Keller often tells the story of two people that got saved. One from a relatively religious family. Christian family, let's call it. They came. He gets saved. And his growth in the first couple of years is marginal because he's been brought up in the church, right? He knows the things. He's been reading his Bible since he was three. There's a small moral change. Yet someone walks in out of the street from a broken home. Language foul. Addicted to who knows how many things. Gets radically saved. How great a jump is the moral success in that person. It's going to seem like much more, right? 
As the Spirit moves in her, she's radically changed. The things that used to attract her and draw her in are suddenly no longer satisfying. And she wants to read the Bible more. Guess what? Although her growth is much more, she still seems like a far worse Christian than the person who grew up in a Christian home. It's just obvious. Yet who is more saved? Neither. They are both the chief of sinners. We have to make this clear because we are so in danger of perverting the argument here. And this opens up our second point. The danger of continual disobedience. Let's ask a a question this morning of this text, of this entire book. What is this danger of disobedience? What is, let's ask, what is the tension of this entire book? What is this sin, this continued sin that the writer is talking about here? Is this, let's just ask a question because it's been used. Is this skipping church? Is this swearing in your car when someone cuts you off? Is this lying? Is this cheating on your taxes? If you continually cheat on your your taxes after you've been saved, there is no salvation for you. Now, we could preach that. And in fact, I could preach that in such a way to really make you feel like a rubbish human being. And all I'd be doing is emotionally manipulating you. Because that's not the argument of the text, is it? If you were to read this text in an entire sitting, in one sitting, and scholars who who do this, pour over this, they would see it's quite plain that the argument of this text is to continue in the faith. That is the text. That is the argument. And so the sin is quite simple. We'll get to it. I didn't say this because many people come to the plain meaning of this text, the plain meaning of this book, and because they were so possessed by either just the text themselves, the single line, or their theological understanding, their system, that they cannot read the text as what it is saying. And unfortunately, us Baptists are are guilty of this. We are. We just are. And, And to justify this, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. I am a convicted and convinced Baptist. I didn't grow up in the Baptist church. I grew into the Baptist church. And I've studied for years and I've found that the heritage of the Baptist church, their distinctives are the most faithful to Scripture when followed correctly. But Baptists are humans. We make mistakes. In fact, our theology is far from perfect. And a text like this exposes that. Because the text, it's painfully, unavoidably clear That the writer is commanding us to continue in the faith. To not slip away. To not fall away from belief. The entire book says this. And and we we struggle to accept this as Baptists because we accept almost a cartoonish. And I have to say that. Because I think the way that we preach once saved, always saved, is a cartoonish version of the original writings of the Puritans. We read this once saved, always saved, so we get to a text like this and say, it can't be us. Because I, you know, I believe I, I can't continue sinning. So this, this text doesn't mean anything to me. Because once saved, always saved. That's not what the text is saying. But it's also not saying that my salvation depends on me, is it? It's saying my salvation depends on Christ. But I have to trust in him. You see, put it simply. I am not the securer of my salvation anyway. Christ is from start to finish. He saves me. He totally saves me. That is the call of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Christ saves me. That he came into the world to die for sinners. Therefore, what is my response? To believe. To keep on believing. To cling to the gospel. And that is the call of the book of Hebrews. That is this text. And this leads us to this famous verse that is so often abused by preachers. 
Verse 26. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there is no sacrifice for sin left. Let's ask the question. What is the deliberate sin in the mind of the author? Because it's not any sin, right? It's a particular sin. And I have to say this because I've heard sermons that justify particular sins using this verse. I've seen people being kicked out of churches because they deliberately and continually continue in, sorry, the sin of arrogance. And then this verse is quoted. Actually, it was in a meeting once like that, a church meeting, where someone was kicked out for the sin of arrogance. And I just looked at my wife and I was like, isn't that all of us? You know, I'm arrogant. And I've got that statement that goes, you know, it's not arrogance if he's just telling the truth. Uh, but, I mean, we've all got a tendency to a little bit of self-wilfulness, right? No, but if you keep on sinning after receiving the truth, there is no salvation left for you. I've even heard stories of people who haven't been in the fellowship. This happens in smaller churches more. You missed, you've missed church too much. You are in danger of deliberately sinning after coming to knowing the truth. Church, that is perverse. It's an abuse of this text. The sin of this passage is simple. It's abandoning Christ for self-righteousness, for works righteousness. And this persists in the church more than you could possibly know. More than you could possibly know. The simple statement is that if you continue to sin, or you continue in the sin of thinking that you can save yourself by what you can do or how you can impress God, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. If your salvation, if you put your salvation in what you are able to achieve, you're in trouble. In fact, just this morning, I saw a, a, a sermon clip of a very famous grace preacher. Let me just put it like that. He said, and this is the exact words. If you want to know that you're a Christian, you need to have continued and visible and increasing righteousness in your life. That is how you know you are a Christian. Now that's, that, that preaches, right? That gets people, okay, well then I know what to do this week. I'm going to... I'm going to get myself more into the Bible. You can actually feel that church going, let's go. Church, that's an abuse. That is a result of what, how you know you are a Christian. It's a secondary to the primary. How do you know that you are a Christian? You believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Spirit then confirms that in you by crying out, Abba, Father. That is the simple start. That is the primary. That is the focus. What is the result of that? You grow in Christ-likeness. Not the other way around. You don't grow in Christ-likeness and so know that you are a Christian. You know that you are a Christian because of what Christ has done for you. And that then grows you in Christ-likeness. In fact... The other way is impossible. This is the funniest thing about being a human. I don't know if you've noticed this. Have you noticed that the harder you try to do something, the worse at it you become? Have you, you know? It seems like the most absurd thing. Who's ever tried to diet? Like, what a contradictory thing. You know, I'm not going to eat nice things. Why everything's nice. I'm going to cut out this thing. It becomes everywhere. Like you cut out carbs and suddenly you've never noticed the smell of bread. And then you're like holding the bag to your face. The harder we try at something, the worse at it we become. In fact, Alan Watts, the, the famous um, 
almost guru of the 1950s and 60s, stumbled on this when he stated, the reason we want to be better is the reason we aren't. You know, tempted virtue ends in evil was basically his argument. If you try and be good, you actually become evil in that goodness. Have you ever noticed that? Because you become manipulative, you become demanding, you become oppressive. Tried virtue is evil. In fact, this is where that famous statement goes. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, As I often say, uh, on a side note, to someone who really just desperately wants their dogs to love them, I constantly say, remember, desperate is never attractive. Even dogs pick that up, right? The more you desperately want something, the harder it is that it becomes. In fact, you become repulsive. The more you try and avoid sin, the more it becomes everywhere, isn't it? becomes more prevalent. This is where the words of, of Paul in Romans is so, so real. How often have you got to the place, Oh, wretched man am I, who will rescue me from this body subject to death? That which I don't want to do is everywhere. That which I want to do, I don't end up doing. God, Lord, save me. You're trying too hard, church. You're trying too hard, and that's the problem. The harder we try to be good, the more evil we enact on the world. I'm just going to throw that out there. We live in an age where we've seen that work out in the most profound and perverse ways. We live in an age of false, of false virtue, do we not? Everything is about trying to do good and be good and for the oppressed and for the outcast and uplifting. And we have enacted more evil in this age than in any other before us. And so the only hope we have, if we think about it logically, is to give up. But that doesn't help either. Who's been there? Let's go back to the diet because it's a safe illustration. You know, you you don't eat things that you like for two days and the scale doesn't move. So you're like, this is not working. Fridge open, everything in your mouth in the next two hours. Does that help? Does that suddenly make you lose weight? (laughs) I mean, this is an absurd statement. You have no hope, so give up. What will that leave you? An absolute wreck. Because you are bent towards sinfulness, are you not? So if you were to give up, where would you end up in hell? Thanks be to God, there's a third way. There is a third way, and this is the gospel. It's only in the gospel that the human soul is freed To actually enact good on the world because we're stripped of our need to be good. Why? Because in the first time in our lives, our goodness is not something we achieve. Our goodness is something that is granted to us by Jesus. Christ becomes our goodness. Christ becomes our acceptance and our beauty and our wonder and our freedom. You are good in Christ. Last week we looked at this. You are perfect. Christ makes perfect all those who are sanctified. And this is why the Christian, more than anyone else in the world, is actually truly free to do good in the world. And if you do a causal study in history, you'll see that we, Christians, who really believe the gospel, are the ones who actually did bring about real, lasting changes of good upon the world. No one else. It's the church that started the hospitals. It's the church that started the orphanage. It's the church that started the schools and the universities. And those things that advanced human civilization. Did they start them to prove to the rest of the world that they were good? No. They looked at what their Savior had done and said, well, let's do likewise. Jesus was for the orphan. He was for the outcast. Let's go look after them. And the Romans were appalled. 
Justice, uh, not Justice, uh, Julius the Apostate, writing in the city of Delphi. He's appalled. He says, you pagans do not even look after your own, yet these Christians are looking after the rubbishes of society. They're shaming us. Why were we looking after the rubbishes of society? So that we could prove to the Romans that we were better than them? Well, because we saw the rubbishes, the leftovers, the, the cast outs, and we saw ourselves in them and simply loved. This was not a project. It was not a way to win favor. It was not a way to garner and change the world. It was just there to do. And we were free to do it. Christians and Christians alone are more freer than any other person in the world to enact good. Because we're the only ones who actually can simply just do good without any need for reward. Because we already have it. Don't you see that? Let's go back to the original point. Can any of your imperfections take away what Christ has done for you? If the gospel's true, no. Can any of your moral virtues add to what Christ has done for you? If the gospel is true, no. So what does that mean? You're okay. You're good in God's sight. Now go figure out how to live that out. Do it according to his leading. Do it according to his word. And that frees you. And that, that really, really frees you. Imagine just giving money to someone and really, really just doing it because you can. I've seen acts like this in this church. Where a person comes to me and says, I do not want to be known. Make sure the person receiving this does have, has no clue where this is coming from. God has blessed me. I just want to bless them. I've seen insane acts like that in this church. You won't believe how much money has gone through the accounts to people who need it. And the single demand is, please don't let them know. Why? Why would someone do that? Why would they hide themselves like that? Because they're okay. They don't need a pat on the back for that. They don't even need me, the pastor, to say, Yo, what a saint. They're free. They're really free. I've seen people work in the back. I've seen people serve each other. I've seen conversations that happen in the back of this church that no one will ever know. There's no pat on the back. There's no such a saint. Oh, God is going to pour his blessings upon you. Just a simple, Jesus has done this for me. I want to just serve people. That's the wonder. That's the wonder of the gospel. And you know what that really enables you to be? Is better. Not because you're trying, but because God already says you are. One of the most freeing things I've ever had is to think, why do the sin? It's stupid. Rather than, well, ah, the sin is taking me away from God. No. I've offended my Savior. Why would I do that? He loves me regardless. Why would I then run into the thing that offends him? Do you see the shift in mindset? Do you see the freedom? Do you see the lack of trying and the grace in that? See, church, I'm going to put this back to you. All this sounds somewhat, somewhat like a pipe dream, right? It does sound a little bit like pie in the sky-ish, because guess what? You're going to do something tomorrow, you're going to feel bad about it, and what's the, the instant, absolute thought that's going to pop into your head? God doesn't love me anymore. Something bad's going to happen to you. What's going to be the instant instinctive thought that pops into your head. I must have offended God. And so you might be saying to me, Pastor, what you're preaching sounds nice. 
but is impossible. I want to say back to you, rhetorical friend that is helping my sermon carry on, you are absolutely right. It is impossible. It's impossible. What I'm asking you to do is impossible. Your nature does not align with this. This is why Jesus said to his disciples, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And you know what you're actually doing when you think that this is impossible? You're leaning back onto self-righteousness. I can't do this. I'm going to mess this up. And my answer to you is absolutely you're going to mess this up. To quote a famous uh, preacher, if my salvation depended upon me, I would have lost it already. But it doesn't. God has called you to something that is not humanly possible. To a righteousness that you cannot do on your own. To a goodness that you have no hope at all of even getting close to. I mean, let's just go back to the call of this church. More people, more like Jesus. That is the most pipe dreamist, absurdist vision of any organization on the planet. We want to make a whole bunch of people that are the perfect human beings. We actually want to make more people perfect. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. Church, how how well has this week been about you becoming more like Jesus? How perfect have you been this week? Have you hit the mark? Are we failing? Absolutely not. Because our dependency is not upon us becoming more like Jesus but about him making himself more and more prevalent in our lives. In him doing it, not us. And that is why it's by faith. That is the wonder of it. That is the joy. That is the reward. That it is by faith that you are growing. Let me do an experiment in your life to close off this morning. Any one of you have walked the Christian road for a a number of decades now. Do you feel right now like you've got it all together? Like you're just running from one victory to the next? That sin is far behind you and the the chains thereof have fallen off and you are free? Do you feel like that? I felt like that for about a day after I got saved and it's never been for me. In fact, the longer I get, the more I notice how deep the roots of sin goes, right? The longer I'm saved. And so in the moment, I look and I'm like, Lord, I am worse than when you first saved me. Until for a second, for just a second, I stop and I look at 18-year-old me. I look at 17-year-old me before I was saved. And I'm shocked at the growth that God has caused in my life. I'm shocked. You know what the wonder is? I can't put it down to a single thing that I did that has made that change. That's the beauty of grace. I've literally stumbled forward in this journey of faith and find myself where I am. And the wonder of it, the the glory of it, is I will stumble along with every single one of you here all the way to the very throne room of God in the life to come. And we'll look back and we'll look at each other and think, what a wonder we've become. And not one of us will be able to say, well, it's when I did this that it changed. It's when I implemented this program It's when I stopped eating carbs, you know? There's nothing to boast in. Day by day, church, we we learn to live in the gospel reality that he has secured for you. It's a stumbling. It's the wonder of the life we call to in Christ. It's the freedom of it. It's actually the whimsical nature of the gospel. 
Isn't it whimsical that God has called someone like you to be like him? I think it is. I think it's a big joke that he's called someone like me to be like him. It's amazing. 20 years odd after starting this journey and telling people that I'm a doctorate in theology and a pastor at, uh, at a church, when I meet people from my school days, the single answer, the single answer is, Barry, you are a pastor. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So church, are you in danger of committing the unforgivable sin? Only if you think that your salvation is up to you. If not, stumble forward towards the throne. Whimsically discover the beauty and the wonder and the freedom that God has truly called for you. Called you too, sorry. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, as we again bask in the wonder of the cross... In the joy that you've come into the world to save sinners like us, we also bask in the freedom, the freedom to grow in Christ-likeness. So Lord, help us together to encourage each other to, to acts of love and good works, not to prove ourselves, not to one-up ourselves, but because it's just good and you've made us good. Help us discover the freedom that we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in light, in light of that, Lord, that we would, we would truly live a life worthy of who you are, a life worthy of what you're calling us to and what you have made us. And so we pray this to the glory of the Father and in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you stand?